a subject tonight that we're going to look at that I think is probably the most vital and important for people to know about if they're interested in health. Governments of the world expend not millions, but hundreds of billions of dollars, thousands of millions on health. And yet, this is a subject that is grossly ignored, totally set aside, and not even considered in public health policies. And that is, I think, the greatest tragedy of the 20th and 21st centuries. The Earth Foundation of Health is predicated on the concept that we are not made out of stardust, but rather we are made out of earth dust. The Creator made us from the substances of the earth. And if we sever our relationship with the earth, we're severing our relationship with the sources of life, health, and physical, mental sustenance. So it's a very important topic, and I'm glad to see that you're here this evening. So we'll now go into the presentation. Um, Dr. Charles Northern was a medical doctor who decided he'd had enough of giving drugs and practicing medicine decided he'd really do something about health instead of palliating symptoms after people's bodies and minds broke down. He says, I gave up medicine because this, referring to advanced agriculture, is a wider and more important work. Sick soils mean sick plants, sick animals, and sick people. Physical, mental, and moral fitness depends largely upon an ample supply and proper proportion of the minerals contained in our foods. We must make soil building the basis or the foundation of food building in order to accomplish human building. Modern agribusiness and other technology has been very potent in eroding the soils of our earth in fact, at a rate that is 10 times faster than the rate at which our soils are being replenished. This rate of soil erosion is much higher, actually, in developing world countries in regions of Africa and Asia, such as India and China. Erosion rates there are running at 30 to 40 times higher than the rates of replenishment. Food that is grown on nutrient-deficient soils lack the nutrients essential to the health of all higher life forms, including people. <clears throat> so we see that massive-scale monocropping throughout the earth has led to three-fourths of the genetic diversity of our world um, of the world's 20 major food crops being lost from the fields of farmers. So we're talking about the major food crops like corn and beans and um, various grains. At one time there were literally thousands of varieties of different kinds of foods. When I was um, in the 1990s I visited the International Potato Center near Quito, Ecuador and um, was amazed to see on display, not hundreds, but nearly 2,000 varieties of potatoes of every color, of every size you can imagine. And um, some people have concluded that Machu Picchu in southeastern Peru near Cuzco was actually an agricultural research center because they were able to grow plants at multiple elevations and climates, microclimates. And um, so the Amerindian peoples, the peoples of Central or Meso-America as well as North America, were very advanced horticulturalists and agriculturalists. In fact, about 70% of the food supply in terms of fresh fruits and vegetables originated in pre-Columbian North Central and South American agriculture. Avocados, tomatoes, potatoes, squashes, sunflowers, an incredible variety of foods were developed in the Americas while well, the Europeans were living mostly on um, grains and, and meats, actually. That was in part why they were so subject to infections. Infection was a very common problem in, um, 
in Europe and we had major plagues like the bubonic plague wiping out millions of people. So we, we've lost you know, an enormous quantity of genetic diversity from the earth because of the interest in modern agribusiness to just um, produce a few types of varieties of corn and, and other major food crops. And um, the traditional polyculture practices of tr tribal or indigenous peoples all over the world actually produce the incredible varieties of foods that we find today in the world that have been, although largely, lost to farmer's fields. There are some who have developed seed banks um, in order to preserve a lot of these unique varieties. Um, however, um, most people are just going to the local you know, food markets and buying local seeds that are very limited in terms of their variety. Um, it's also the popular belief that synthetic chemicals really bear no difference from, from uh, natural fertilizers. And that the chemicals found in chemical fertilizers, fertilizers are identical to the minerals, for instance, found in stones. But uh, a prominent horticulturalist named David Phillips points out the fact that this is not the case. In fact, he says that um, there is a life force factor when you're employing natural fertilizers. And so what a synthetic chemical appears to represent a natural one in the same way that a waxen image represents a real living image or a real living being. For one thing, the popular NPK synthetic fertilizers do not bind the soil and plants, which can use a small portion of the nutrients. The rest pollutes and destroy the natural environment. I can remember um, traveling in northeastern Thailand and the uh, agricultural representative from this government pointed to all the lands we were going by, these rice fields. He said, everything is dead. The soils have died because of the chemicals being applied, both the pesticides as well as the fertilizers. He says, there's not a frog in the waters, that there's not a fish swimming, there are no insects in the grass, there's nothing living in the soil, everything is dead. And that really is where modern agriculture is leading us towards destroying the, the soils upon which our life depends. These chemicals also volatize and pollute the air. They contaminate aquifers. We've all heard of the Green Revolution that was supposed to be so great that took agriculture to places like India and would feed the world. Well, the reality is these high nitrogen fertilizers actually end up causing uh, nitrosamines in the environment as well as in the plants, which are cancer-causing agents. So all over the world now where cancer was virtually non-existent, we have cancer epidemics occurring thanks to these agricultural methods. Uh, chemical fertilizers also damage the beneficial microbes in the soil. For instance, and also ammonium sulfate is very destructive to the life of earthworms, which are critical for healthy soils. Um, a small percent of high nitrogen fertilizers actually, that actually get into the plants force fast growth that bring weak watery cell growth in sickly plants. And the imbalance and the weakness of these cells invite insect pests and diseases. If, you're, if your plants are healthy, they'll be impervious to these um, insect pests and plant diseases. Here we see the critical food web which is killed by chemical fertilizers. The bacteria, the protozoa, the fungi, the nematodes, and anthropods, and so forth. Um, the nematodes, they're all destroyed by these chemicals in our fertilizers. I remember uh, some years ago speaking with the entomologist who's quite prominent, David Pimentel from Cornell University. And he was talking about the insanity of pesticide usage. The share of crop yields lost to insects has nearly doubled, had nearly doubled, he said, from 7% to 13% during the last 40-year period. In this, in this period, there was a more than 10-fold increase. That's a 1,000% you know, increase in the amount and in the toxicity of synthetic insecticides 
that were being used over this 40-year period. So you had a doubling of losses to insects and to pests, despite a tenfold increase in toxicity and quantity. And he says, if this wasn't damning enough, it was also found that often less than a tenth of one percent of pesticide applications actually reach the targeted pests. They're just destroying the environment. Making plants in our image. There's a textbook on plant pathology, just like there's books on human pathology. If we look at a modern textbook of domesticated crop diseases, the number and variety of diseases is very comparable to the wide range of human illnesses that we find in the textbook of medicine. The correlation is remarkable. Wrench stated, I take it that what has happened to man has happened to no less to his domesticated plants. Science has effected a marvelous progress in variety and fragmentation, but at the same time it has torn plants from the traditional conditions upon which their health depends. There is no doubt, I think, that modern man has made plants, plant life, into his own image. The earth is really very amazing. Um, it's incredible what the Creator has designed and made and sustains. In the earth there are mysteries that science has just barely touched. Um, like for instance, and I don't mention it in the text here, but if we talk about just plants, plants that have the potential for foods and medicines, an extremely small fraction of those plants, maybe 2%, are understood well by Western science. 98% are still unknown. If we go to the soil, living soils, just one teaspoon of living soil has more living organisms in it than the entire human population on this planet. And unnumbered species of soil bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, anthropods, still unknown to science. It's evident that we need to more fully respect the fabric of the living systems on the earth that we walk upon. Here we look at the food web and we see, you know, organic matter and how it feeds the bacteria and the fungi and the root feeders, the nematodes and the anthropodes, the shredders. They each have a role to play. And finally they feed the higher life forms. And we have all these levels, it's very complex, and, but it's very critical. And if, if this cycle is broken, this web is broken, um, we're endangering all life forms above the earth. The plants send natural sugars and starches down to their roots to feed the bacteria at the uh, rhizosphere level. We have thus a symbiotic relationship. The bacteria in turn feed the plants and the roots with a boost of uh, nitrogen that's natural and sufficient to their needs and multiple micronutrients in a steady stream. Now, have you ever been to the redwoods down in California? They're massive trees. Did you ever wonder why there isn't a depression beneath them as big as the trees are? Where did all that physical substance come from? That enormous bulk. Think about it, it came from the atmosphere. There is nitrogen in the air and it feeds these roots. And that nitrogen builds these trees and other plants. It's a very incredible process when you think about it. And um, I remember hearing about a discovery of a very ancient redwood tree that was discovered and was petrified. And it was at a construction site. And it was far larger than any of the modern redwoods. So trees were much, much bigger if we go back into early human history. We'll talk about that a little further on in this presentation. Um, these natural nutrients are more easily and healthfully absorbed by the plants, unlike chemical fertilizers. And we see symbiosis all through nature, not only plants, but animals, and, and in some respects within humanity. Now let's consider early soil conditions. If we go back thousands of years ago, earth soils had an abundance of major and minor trace minerals. And this combined with high atmospheric oxygen levels ensured incredible health, stature, and longevity for all creatures living on the Earth's surface. The plants were much larger. The animals were, were of giant size. Human beings were of great stature. The 
um, evolutionists would have us believe that we are improving physiologically, that we've come up from lower life forms and we're getting bigger and better and taller. And this is utter nonsense. The paleopathological records and the archaeological records show us and the, and the fossil records show us clearly and abundantly that the exact opposite is true. Soils that are abundant in minerals are vibrantly alive. Billions of microbes flourish as they feast on the mineral elements and impart into plants nutrients that are critical for sustaining optimum health. So we see here that commercialized soils are dry, they've died, whereas living soils are damp and you'll find roughly one billion diff different forms of um, bacteria and microbial life per teaspoon. That's a thousand million. The average mineral content in selected vegetables, now this is spanning the period of 1914 to 1997. And we see at the beginning of this period, now this, they're taking an average of these various basic uh, minerals, calcium, magnesium, iron, and they're averaging everything with cabbage, lettuce, tomato, spinach. We see an average here level of 400 milligrams. And this drops and drops and drops till by 1948, we're down to about 148 milligrams. By 1963, we're down to 75 milligrams and it's more or less stabilized for these particular products, but at a very, very low level, several hundred percent lower than what it should be. Um, a recent report that used U.S. agricultural records found that the nutrient content of fruits, fruits and vegetables have been rapidly dropping since records were first taken back in the early 1960s, um, which is roughly 50 years ago. To illustrate, um, it was observed that we'd need to eat five apples today just to get the same level of nutrients that you would find in one apple in 1965. Our soils are just being destroyed. In the 1940s, late 1940s, a typical bowl of spinach would have about 158 milligrams of iron. By the year 1982, it's 42 years later, that same amount of spinach would normat normatively contain less than 2.2 milligrams of iron, a drop from 158 milligrams to roughly two milligrams. It's incredible. Um, it's almost like eating cardboard. The mineral content found in corn in the 1920s was 5%. So if you, if you actually took the corn and broke it down, 5% of the physical body of the corn consisted of minerals. Today, it's less than 1%. Here we see another table um, showing the correlation between different human diseases and mineral depletion in our foods. Here we see heart conditions between 1980 and 94 increasing by nearly 20%, chronic bronchitis increasing by about 56%, same time, <coughs> time span, asthma increasing by nearly 90% between 1980 and 1994, uh, tinnitus increasing by about 25%, and born deformities increasing by nearly 50%. And the mineral deficiencies associated with these diseases are listed to the right of each of these diseases, showing that as we lose these minerals in our foods, we are becoming more susceptible to each of these diseases we just went over. Today, roughly 100 trace minerals and elements are deficient in human diets throughout most regions of the world. The importance of various plant-derived minerals to maintain and restore animal and human health has been well established in the research literature. For example, if we just look at one trace mineral, a minor trace mineral, zinc, um, the absence of that from the human diet is symptomized by acne, infertility, poor vision, stretch marks, allergies, PMS, premenstrual uh, syndrome, poor memory, mental and emotional problems, and poor growth uh, development in children. Satellite photographs in Africa have shown how gigantic flights of locusts will cover thousands of miles 
ignoring healthy vegetation, and then descend and destroy fields where the soil is worn out. This phenomena parallels the relationship of microbes, whether viruses or bacteria, to human disease, as well as disease in animals and plants. Pathogenic microorganisms act as nature's sensors. They proliferate and are pathogenic only when the human host's psycho and physiological system has been imbalanced and weakened by factors such as stress, malnutrition, and endo and environmental toxins. This really is the basis of understanding immunity. It's not playing around with memory T cells and B lymphocytes through injecting things into the human body. It's understanding nature and working with the natural order the Creator has established. British imperial botanist Sir Albert Howard, early in the 20th century, traveled to the area of Indore, India, where he, um, he, his first step was to regenerate his soils there naturally. These were experimental gardens. He was doing this for the British Empire. And what he found was quite amazing that as he regenerated his soils, everything growing on those soils became immune to all forms of disease as well as pests. He understood the true role of disease in agriculture um, and that diseases is actually an act of censorship by nature by pointing out crops that are imperfectly nourished. To quote him, disease resistance is the natural reward of healthy and well-nourished protoplasm. Pesticide use is unscientific and radically unsound. Animals fed on his crops became totally immune to all known animal diseases. Although, and I quote him again, epidemic diseases such as rinderpest, hoof and mouth disease, septicemia frequently devastated the countryside. None of my animals were segregated. None were inoculated. They frequently came in contact with these diseases and disease stock. And no case of infectious disease ever occurred among them. Common sense. And it works. The Wheel of Health and Natural Immunity. Um, G.T. Wrench wrote a book entitled The Wheel of Health, which had to do with his observations of a society of people in the land called Hansa, which was a small kingdom just uh, north of Pakistan, between China and Pakistan. It recently became a protectorate under the government of Pakistan about, I think, 20 years ago or so. Um, and was very isolated from the world until about 20 years ago when a road, a major road was put in. The importance of the method of culture of food is primary, radical, and fundamental in the matter of health. Nature endows life with a powerful and eternal capacity to renew itself healthfully given the right conditions. Um, there's a new field of science called epigenetics, which actually demonstrates this principle. We can actually turn on and turn off healthy and unhealthy genes by our choices. We can create a strong development of our genes so that future generations are stronger, or we can destroy our genes so future generations are weaker. It used to be thought that the genes were just you know, unchangeable. But science is now finding the exact opposite is, in fact, true. The people of Hansa were noted for their extreme longevity and unparalleled immunity to disease. They had two feet of black topsoil that was routinely remineralized by their riverbed silt fed by glacial waters. These glaciers would rub against the uh, granite rock face of these huge mountains, and the, the silt in the riverbeds would be brought in with nets and applied to the fields. Thus, the soils in this country were the highest of any place in the world. The only place that even comes close to it is the Nile River Delta, where it floods, and a similar kind of process occurs. Um, what's fascinating with the Hunza cuts is when their babies are born, their teeth are all fully developed in their mouths at birth. And uh, it's the only country or place in the world where traditionally the males are breastfed longer than the females and the men outlive the women in Hansa. 
which is quite interesting. They actually, when they switch them to a mixed diet of both um, breast milk and other foods, they actually continue breastfeeding the girls until the age of three and the boys until the age of four, which is pretty amazing too. <laughs> Um, in the early 20th century, Sir Robert McCarrison was amazed, in his words, at the health and immunity of the Hansas. And he states that um, though they were surrounded on all sides by people afflicted with all kinds of degenerative and pestilential diseases, referring to inf infectious diseases, they still did not contract any of them. They had total immunity to all forms of disease. So it is possible. A 20th century culture and society showed us that this is possible. A miller in Germany from the 19th century named Julius Hensel first discovered the agricultural value of rock dust while he was grinding grain. He noticed that the rock powder accidentally mixed into some of the meal that he had ground. So he sprinkled some of this over the soil in his gardens he'd planted, and the results were astonishing. He repeated the experiment and applied, applied the stone meal to his fruit trees. To his amazement, the apple trees, which had previously uh, borne wormy and imperfect fruit, now produced fine quality fruit free from worms. <clears throat> he wrote a book entitled um, um, Bread from Stones. That was a, the starter. And this book was read by a man named Samson Morgan, who was sort of the Luther Burbank of England. And uh, he began to experiment with this method. And he developed a system that he coined clean culture agriculture because it avoided dung, which he considered impure and unclean because of diseased microorganisms in the waste from animals and humans. He avoided that. But he also avoided fertilizers that were chemical, synthetic, and produced by industry. And what he did was he used stone dust from rock or stones. And stones, if you think about it, are the only substance on this earth, the only material on this earth that contain all the trace minerals that existed at the earliest point in human history. Every trace mineral is there. He said, my long continued studies in the dust have convinced me that diseases in soils, plants, and men arise from conditions brought about by the introduction of poisons and by an imperfect environment. And experiments have satisfied me beyond doubt that this is the natural and the correct explanation. Perfect food might even in time render the human race invulnerable to disease. <clears throat> it was fascinating. In his um, gardens, he produced fruits and vegetables that were totally immune to disease. And, um, and of giant size, I think I might be showing us some slides on it a little further on. Looking more into the question of the earth and, um, and our immunity, someone um, in a book entitled Empty Harvest, Understanding the Link Between Our Food, Our Immunity, and Our Planet, it's actually Bernard Jensen and um, another author, they make the comment that an antibiotic is a plant's immune system. Animals and humans do not produce antibiotics, nor do they need to if their endo endocrine, immune, and nervous systems have the mineral, vitamin, protein, and enzyme substances found in foods grown on mineral-rich soils. Our individual immune systems are inescapably linked to the planet Earth of whose substance we're made. When we harm that system, the inevitable result is our own degeneration. Since the soils of Earth today are quite sick and depleted due to long ages of erosion, leaching, overgrazing, and chemical farming, we obviously need a solution. And so when we use finely ground stone dust and apply it to such soils, we have restored them to the early conditions that existed on this Earth. And the result is vibrant and healthy crops that sustain very high levels of animal and human health. So the question is, why should we remineralize? These are some of the points. There's a slow natural release of vital elements and trace minerals. 
the nutrient intake of plants render better flavor, greater health in animals and humans. It increases the microorganisms and earthworm activity in the soil. It increases crop yields by a range of 200 to 400 percent greater yield. So this could be the solution to, to feeding a starving world where millions are dying every year from starvation. It increases resistance to plant diseases, insect pests, frost, and drought. What's interesting too, foods grown on these kinds of soils, their shelf life is extended by uh, three to four hundred percent. Instead of beginning to rot in a matter of days, they'll rot in weeks, weeks later. The, the, also, they're much more impervious to frost damage. It rebalances soil pH, it builds human con, uh, humus complex and prevents erosion and it increase, decreases the dependence on pesticides, herbicides, and the need for chemical fertilizers. In fact, there are millions of tons of byproducts at stone quarries throughout the earth where their aggregate and stone industries are you know, producing vast amounts of this, um, this stone dust. Hard silicate rocks of igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary origins contain the full spectrum of minerals and trace elements as as mentioned earlier, Samson Morgan, who we talked about a little while ago, he employed, as I mentioned, this method, calling it clean culture agriculture. He had massive increases in his output and giantism in his foods. In fact, he grew pears that weighed two pounds and apples, including the largest apple ever recorded in modern history at 34 and a half ounces and exceeding a foot in circumference. It was sold on the London auction market at a very high price. Uh, onions averaging one pound and celery up to 40 inches in length. He also aerated the soils so they could maximize the nitrogen content going into the roots of the plants and added humus as well, natural plant humus. In the early 20th century, the average potato yield for the world stood at roughly six tons per acre. This is when Morgan did his experiments. In wheat, 15 bushels was the average yield. Morgan stated, I broke all records for potatoes, digging fine samples at the rate of 65 tons an acre. So he increased it from 6 tons to 65 tons. That's like a tenfold increase. A success never achieved by any other experimenter. And as for wheat, he was able to produce up to 100 bushels per acre, an increase from 15 bushels to 100 bushels per acre. He aptly concluded that the colossal loss of foodstuffs through the present system is criminal. <clears throat> a man here in the United States named John Hamaker, um, he co-authored a book um, in, um, entitled, um, oh, no, wait a minute, it was, yeah, it was co-authored by himself and uh, actually a friend of mine who lives in, in California, uh, and John Hamaker himself did some experiments um, on this method of growing. In the United States, the average corn yield is 25 bushels per acre. He more than doubled that at 65 bushels per acre just by adding stone dust to the soil. And upon analysis, it was found that the corn grown on nearby farms using chemical fertilizers, um, his corn had 28%, Hamaker's corn had 28% more protein, 47% more calcium, 57% more phosphorus, 60% more magnesium, and 90% more potassium. And um, yeah, he brought a book entitled The Survival of Civilization on, on this subject. It was co-authored by, um, I'm trying to think of his name, it'll come to me in a second. I'll bring it up when it comes to my mind. Um, the co-author who, whom I've met actually is a raw food person, and when I last saw him a few years ago, he said it had been like, I think it was 27 or 28 years since he had his last cooked meal. <laughs> and, but, but interestingly, he was very um, muscular and, and well-built. He wasn't skin and bones, as you would think. Um, and his height was six foot six. He's very tall. And he lives in Portola Valley, California. And um, quite an amazing person. To, uh, to come across. In fact, he wrote a book entitled To Love the Earth, and it's free to download if you go on the internet. Um, that's it, his name is Don Weaver. 
just look for To Love the Earth. It's a book about this issue. And he uses ground stone dust using this method. And I think that's partly why he's able to live on raw foods and thrive so well, um, because of the advanced soil that he's using. Now it would be about 30 years since he had his last cooked meal. Um, Albert Savage was someone else who did experiments. And um, he also used the same methods as Morgan in England. And Savage, I believe, was from the American South, Mississippi or Alabama. And marketed spinach grown on ordinary soils contained in a range of 600 to 1600 parts per billion of iodine. Spinach grown on his remineralized soils contained as much as 640,000 parts per billion versus 600 to 1600. Testing revealed that various vegetables grown in his quote mineral garden um, the produce possessed as much as 400% more iron and other major minerals than the crops grown using conventional growing methods. Um, in forest soils, they found that um, with some long-term experiments in Germany, a forest where pine seedlings were remineralized after 24 years, they went back in the wood volume in these remineralized trees had been remineralized through the earth, was 400% greater than in the trees nearby that had not received the stone dust application. In fact, it was found that one application of rock dust was effective for a period of 60 years to feed these trees. <clears throat> men, men of the Trees is an international voluntary group that plants about a half a million trees every year, mostly in arid climates in 48 different countries. And they did some field tests using stone dust. They found a 500% greater growth rate for the, tr tr for the treated trees versus the controls of the same species. And the potting out time was reduced from five months to only six weeks by having their soils in this condition. <clears throat> Someone in California where there's a, a um, major epidemic of sudden oak death, Remember Dutch elm disease? Well, the same kind of thing is happening with oaks in California where oak trees are dying very quickly. And this, um, the mainstream scientific approach is trying to kill this P. ramoram, which is the pathogen they've identified by applying pesticides. This Dr. Klinger has instead been painting the tree bark with an alkaline mineral wash containing stone dust and placing a mined mineral powder, azomite, that has over 70 active minerals and trace elements at the base of these trees. Within a few years, there's new growth and all the bleeding of the bark ends. The trees are healthy and they're thriving again. So here we see um, a tree treated in March of 2004. And the tree is losing its leaves and dying. By March 19 of 2005, the bark is healthy and the leaves are abundant. Credible changes. With the pine trees, this is October of 2005. The branches are thinning out as they're losing um, their leaves. And by October of 2008, about three years later, they're as healthy as could be and, and abundant in, in growth. This is a farm over in um, Scotland called the Sear Center. They use rock dust in their gardens. As you can see, the size of their plants are enormous. <laughs> and uh, the carrot in her left hand and the turnip in her right, and the leek in his right and the summer squash in his left hand. It's quite amazing, the results they're getting. Radiation poisoning. You know when Chernobyl happened, um, Quite amazingly, the whole area, especially where you know that was downwind, um, was severely poisoned by radiation, and you couldn't even eat any of the plants being grown. But one individual had a garden where she had remineralized the soils, and they were amazed because when they went and applied the Geiger counter to their plants, they were free from radiation. Um, metal. Ions such as minerals and trace elements are used in biological systems for catalyzing biological reactions and stabilizing complex protein structures. This is why it's important 
that any biological system, especially plant systems, have access to a broad spectrum of minerals and trace elements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remineralization protects not only soils and plants from radioactivity, but humans as well. People who eat these plants actually obtain immunity to radiation poisoning and can actually reverse the damage from radiation. Supplying abundant minerals, especially trace elements, to the human body improves radiation tolerance, immune system integrity, and radiation exposure recovery. And this is quite amazing. This slide looks at the work of a scientist named R. L. Moody, who way back in the 1920s published his findings entitled The Antiquity of Disease at the University of Chicago Science Series. And what he found was quite amazing, and I'm quoting him here, disease was not present in the earliest times of the Earth's history. Now, for those of you who believe in the biblical record, that probably doesn't come as a surprise. But to those who may not believe the biblical record, it should come as a surprise. It says, as far as animals and plants are concerned, diseases were not present. Disease did not exist even with the most ancient forms of bacteria. The bacteria were all harmless. The viruses were all harmless. The pathogenic pathogenicity of viruses and bacteria are consequences of the degenerative processes that have occurred on this earth over thousands of years. As degeneration occurs, then nature's sensors go to work to clean up the damage. He said, in the earliest periods, of Earth's history, physical injuries and wounds were free from infections. So if you got cut or you wounded yourself, there was no infection. Part of it was, I believe, the high oxygen, but also a major part was the quality of the Earth, the rich mineral content in the foods. Present evidences suggest that a wide distribution of the bacterial types of diseases and the resulting pathology is a relatively recent phenomena. So it's quite amazing coming from this scientist who had researched ancient diseases upon this earth. We have here also published in the 1920s in Anthropology and Medicine, the paleopathologist Ellis Herdlicka. He makes this observation, research on fossil remains of early human life reveal that there is no trace in the adults of any destructive constitutional disease in but little diseases of the alveolar processes. It appears, therefore, that on the whole, early man was remarkably free from disease, at least that would leave any evidence in either his bones or his teeth. And so now we look at some more amazing things. These are common animals that are found on Earth today. Up here, this was discovered in 1954 in the mountains of Mexico, the Sinaloa Mountains, a bat skeleton. Next to it, hanging in this museum in Mexico, is a, an adult human skeleton. The bat is of comparable height and broader breadth, obviously. Here we see supercroc, discovered in northern Africa in the desert, published National Geographic, 40 feet long, 10 tons, it's 20,000 pounds. It's actually the length of a school bus and has a six foot skull and jaw. Here we see what the um, termed um, Beelza bufo, a beach ball sized frog, 16 inches across and weighing 10 pounds. And here we see in comparison, a pencil and a modern bullfrog. This was also, by the way, published in National Geographic. Up above is the wings put on a bird skeleton in South America called a teratorn. This bird has a wingspan. This is in a museum in South America. I believe it's in Argentina. A wingspan of 24 feet. They estimate it weighed over 170 pounds. There's a man standing next to it. Here we see a turtle. This is in the European Museum. There's a similar turtle in the Yale Museum in Connecticut. It, uh, if you could take from the tip of that flipper to that flipper, it's a 20 foot, 20 foot width, a huge, huge turtle. 
And this is maybe the most amazing of all. This is a modern adult male beaver. Here we see the skeletal remains of an ancient beaver about the size of a modern black bear. So, as I said earlier, the animals were all of giant size. But then, so too was man. Time magazine, November 16, 1925, entitled, The Diggers. And I quote here, miners prospecting in the Chihuahua Mountains of Mexico found intact in a hidden cave a group of skeletons measured from crown to heel. They would have stood 10 to 12 feet. Anthropologists have set off to examine these giants. The New Smyrna News, and I've, I've looked at the actual clipping from, this is in Florida, uh, January 6, or I'm sorry, January 5th, 1917. Giants inhabited Florida was the headline. State geologist Sellards and Professor May of the Carnegie Institute concur in opinion after fossil study at Vero, which would be near Vero Beach. They say men grew 12 feet tall. And then they quote one of these scientists that the human beings were of enormous size is evidenced by the bones, some persons being 10 or 12 feet in height. Then we find another interesting article um, in a 19th century journal in Britain, the Archaeologist and Journal of Antiquarian Science, September 1841, February 1842, page 257. Here's what happened, December 1601, in Cumberland and UK, a human giant was found buried at a depth of 12 feet. And they, I quote here, the said giant, spelled G-Y-A-N-T as they spelled in the 1600s, was four yards and a half long. His forehead was two spans and a half broad, translated to modern um, language, 13 and a half feet tall, in a forehead 22 and a half inches in width. Um, also, there's an article in, um, entitled Ancient American Giants in Scientific American, August 14, 1880, page 106. I didn't have space to put that on the slide. The longevity of early man. If we go back to the writings of Josephus, the Jewish historian, nearly 2,000 years ago, and we look at the complete works of Josephus, um, he, had, he made this comment that he said, let no one upon comparing the lives of the ancients with our lives and with the few years which we now live, think that what we have said of them is false, referring to their extreme longevity. In fact, what they said of them was that they lived in centuries, not in decades. And then Josephus refers to the written antiquities of historians and scholars of various early civilizations, much earlier than him, he wrote 2,000 years ago, who confirmed, who affirmed that the lifespan of early man was not lived in decades, but in centuries. In Chaldea, we had the Babylonian historian uh, Berossus. In Egypt, we had the historians Manetho and Hieronymus. In Phoenicia, the historian Mochus. In Syria, the historian Nicholas. And in Greece, several historians, and I won't attempt to read all of their names, but the last one is Ephorus. Um, so it's quite incredible that all the ancient historians attest to this fact, and in fact, the book of Genesis, the Judeo-Christian scripture, says exactly this thing. So um, quite, quite amazing when we think about it. The integrity of human health, heredity, and genetics is maintained precisely to the degree that the elemental deficiencies in the earth are prevented. The natural creation is at all levels embedded by the creator with a higher wisdom of an immutable order and a purposeful balance. It is clear that if we want to maintain a cooperative and regenerative healing relationship with our natural life systems and the forces of earth is the basic and constructive provider of life, that this represents the highest and the most essential strategy for effecting the psychological and physiological regeneration of humankind. In fact, the um, famous natural agriculturalist from Japan named Manasubu Fukuoka said the purpose of agriculture is not to 
production of food, but the perfection of human beings. And one last thing I'd like to comment on is um, a friend of mine in Massachusetts has established an organization, her name is Joanna Campe, called Remineralize the Earth. It's at uh, remineralize.org. And it's a nonprofit that assists the worldwide movement to bring back um, minerals to our soils in the form of ground rock dust, sea minerals, and other natural and sustainable means for increasing the growth, health, and nutrient value of all forms of plant life. Thank you.